Hello, everybody. I expect you are hearing me. Uh, so it is time. Um, I, I think that we should begin the workshop uh, slowly. I'll just prepare my, my presentation here, just share with it with you, and I'll provide some explanations before I begin. Okay. Uh, could, could you just send something in the chat just for me to know that you are hearing me? Okay. Okay, you're hearing. Nice. Um, let me just provide this here. And here. Uh, so, people, thank you very much for showing up. Um, I'm very happy to, to have the opportunity to provide this uh, workshop to, to discuss uh, hypotheses with so many people. Uh, I must confess that when I was invited to, to lecture this workshop, I, I didn't expect to have many people, but there was a great interest uh, in it. And I'm very happy with it. I, I hope I can correspond to your expectations in, in this course. Okay. Um, okay, but, but, but first of all, some, some information before I start. The first one is that I use many different um, articles and some books to, to build this presentation. And I can provide uh, the literature that I use it to you. I'm just uh, place it in the chat when I find it here because the, the window changes here. Um, here is the link, but if you miss this link and want to access it in the web page of the workshop, it is uh, uh, available there too. Uh, so this is all the reference that, that, that I directly or indirectly use it to build this presentation, okay? And uh, I would like to, to begin actually uh, talking a little bit about me, <laughs> because so you, you understand why I'm providing the, this course. Okay. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, here. So actually, I'm from Brazil. Uh, I live here in Belo Horizonte City, uh, which is the capital of Minas Gerais State. And uh, I work at the uh, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Uh, I think that in a free translation, it would be Federal University of Minas Gerais, uh, which is part of the universities here in this picture. Uh, let me just change this one. Uh, I, I actually work in this building. And what I do actually, um, I work with uh, behavior ecology, uh, in particular with agonistic interactions and sexual selection. And um, I mainly study dragonflies and dancerflies, uh, butterflies, and more recently, uh, spiders, okay? And at the university, I also teach uh, disciplines in ecology, statistics, meta-analysis, and also scientific method, and scientific writing. Um, that, that's the reason, this last discipline. And I have uh, some experience on teaching it since 2009. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the organizers of a field course that is held on the Amazon forest since 2009. Uh, it is an intensive training course in which we spend almost uh, 30 days at the forest, just training how we can apply scientific method and writing to develop very small projects uh, of ecology. But why I'm saying all these things is to show you the, the first important information for this uh, workshop is that I'm not a science philosopher. Um, this is important because the, my intention here is to discuss with you uh, when we took some part that was born on, on the philosophy of science and, and how we can apply uh, the, this specific part in practice. 
um, you will see that some points that I will, will use here uh, are discussed by uh, science philosophers, okay? And this is not the point that I want to emphasize in this presentation. My, my point is thinking that I want to use some specific approach. How can I implement it in practice? Okay, so um, how I imagine that we should divide this workshop? We have two days and on the first day, my intention is to begin by discussing um, a super simplified version of what is science. This is important because um, I will use it to show where in, in science the, the approaches that I will discuss with you may, may be fit, maybe um, we may use it, okay, where, where it is located. After this, uh, I will discuss with you how animal behavior specifically can fit into the definitions that I will show. And I will use this actually to discuss two different approaches, uh, which is confirmatory and exploratory research, okay? After that, I will discuss with you how we can use or the necessity to use hypotheses in confirmatory research. And the next step will be to discuss uh, how we could begin to think a project to think I studied from where, where we should begin. And for this, I will show you uh, what I call the Fantastic Four. Um, I think that today we'll be able to see two of them, which is the fact and the question. If we have time, we'll see the, the four of them today, but, but I'm not sure that there will be enough time. If we haven't the time on day two, tomorrow, we will begin by meeting the other two of the Fantastic Four, which is the hypothesis and prediction. After this, I will discuss with you how we can differentiate between hypotheses and predictions. Basically, I will show you the difference between what is called theoretical and operational variables. After that, um, I'll show you what I, uh, th this is the name I gave, okay, the big old boys. Uh, but basically, I will show you things that should be avoided, which is called harking, p hacking, and cherry picking. Next, uh, we'll discuss how we can use a theoretical framework to improve the formulation of our hypothesis, hypothesis in our studies, in our projects. And to finish the second day, I will show you how we can bind, we can mix uh, the, the Fantastic Four, the first steps that I'll show to you, and the theoretical framework in an introduction uh, of a scientific article, okay? Um, during my presentation, I will make many small pauses, intervals, uh, to open for questions, okay? So I ask you to, to, to keep your microphone muted, but when I open the question, uh, you can raise your hand, I think, here in, in, the, in the Zoom, and I will, just look the first person that, that provided the rise of his hand uh, and I ask the person one, he can, he or she can open the microphone to make a question. If the person don't feel comfortable in making, in, in speaking, uh, you can write the question, the chat. And if I'm unable to understand because the, uh, English is not my native language, uh, I will ask you to write down the question in the chat, to send privately to me, so I read the question and answer it, okay? So I hope to, to have at least four uh, intervals, about 10 minutes each, so we can discuss some points that I think that may be more difficult to understand during the, the, this presentation, okay? Um, in, in, the, in this meantime, I won't be able to look at the chat because we have so many participants, so I, I just ignore the, the chat, okay? If there is something very important that I'm not uh, noticing, just open the microphone and talk to me that I will stop the, the presentation and listen to you. So um, when I start this course, uh, I often ask the students, both undergrad and graduation students, what is science? And often this is the most frequent face expression that I receive when I make this question. 
Uh, actually, when I when we think about science, uh, there is some discussion about what it is science, what is what is fitted into science, what cannot be considered science. So it is not so straightforward as we may think uh, um, in a first time. But for this course, I try to provide a, a simplified version of what is science. And for this, I just went to the Google and uh, searched for definitions of what is science, okay? And the first one that I found was the first one that just appeared in the first page on Google was actually provided by the Oxford Dictionary. Um, and they, sorry. And they uh, state that science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Okay. Uh, I also found in a second one that I that was uh, actually surprised uh, provided by Wikipedia uh, here which states that science is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe, okay? Uh, I searched in the Cambridge Dictionary, which provides this one, that science is a careful study of the structure and behavior of the physical world, especially by watching, measuring, and doing experiments, and the development of theories to describe the results of pure and applied science. Uh, there were some details there that was, I, I used this point here. And the last one, I searched for a definition provided by some famous researcher, and I found this one by Edward Wilson. Uh, he defined science as the organized systematic enterprise that gathers knowledge about the world and condenses the knowledge into testable laws and principles. Uh, as you may be noticing, noticing uh, here, for, for, for my happiness, they, they have a lot of uh, definitions, uh, a lot of parts of these definitions that are very similar to one another, okay? And I decided to highlight three points that I think is important for us in this course. Uh, the first one is all of them, the four definitions that I found, provide information on this systematic study, systematic enterprise, careful study, and again, a systematic enterprise. So, uh, they have this uh, similarity in which they state that science somehow is related to a systematic study, a systematic way to make some studies, some approach, okay? The second similarity uh, is this one, highlighted in green, that they state that science has to be related to observation and experiment, to testable explanations and predictions, to watching, measuring, doing experiments, or testing laws and principles. So uh, again, they agree in that science should be related to experiments, to observation, to things that we may be able to test, okay? And I think that the most important one, the third similarity, is that all of them points to, to an intellectual activity, an intellectual and practical activity, to th something that should organize and build knowledge, development theories, or condense knowledge. So all definitions uh, somehow relate to the notion that we should integrate and build knowledge and not just provide data, okay? And, and I think this is the most important point when we are thinking of, about science. Uh, because it is not just data gathering, it's, rela it's also related to understand things, to understand how this data may be generated, okay? I, I will talk a lot about mechanisms and processes, and this is related to this last blue highlight that I provided here, okay? Uh, but by using these definitions, we can begin to discuss how animal behavior can be fitted uh, into science, okay? For this, I will show two different hypothetical examples to you, okay? So let's think about the first one. Uh, for example, let's imagine that you are walking on the field, just enjoying the sun, and then you decided to search for interesting things in the field, and you found this ladybug. Okay, 
Um, imagine that this ladybug, you, you have found a lot of them uh, spread in, oh, let's just stop showing here, okay. Spread uh, in a given plant species, okay. And when you look at this plant species, you find many different individuals of the same species. The greater one are females and the smaller one are males. And you also note that some males are mating with females and other males are completely alone. And you may be curious about why there are some males that are alone in this situation, okay? And if you want to, to investigate uh, why this may occur, you may, for example, uh, go to the field, make some observations. And for this, imagine that you decided to uh, se randomly select 40 plants, uh, for individual, sorry, of the same plant species. And in each plant, you sample all males that you found, the or that you find. And when you are sampling or collecting the males, you register whether each male was mating or not mating, okay? After this, you go to the lab and you decide to make some measures of measurements of male traits, such as body mass, fat content, immune response, and flight capacity, okay? After doing these measures of each male, you finally make some correlations to uh, investigate whether uh, the mating status of each male may be related to uh, each one of these four traits that you had measured, okay? Uh, after doing this, you may ask if this could be considered science, okay? So if we go back to the definition, the first question should be, is this an intellectual and practical activity? And my impression is that yes, it is because you had to plan how to collect the data. You had to. You were interested in evaluating whether uh, mating or not by, by each male was related to male activities. So it is a kind of intellectual and practical activity. Then you may ask if this is a systematic study. Uh, if you decided, for example, to make a random sample of all the plants available. You decide to collect each male uh, that you find in each plant. Yes, this is a systematic study. Okay, you, you determine uh, a systematic approach to collect your data. So yes, and finally, if this is relied on an observation or experiment, and again, if you are observing a natural pattern in the field, and yes, we can conclude that this is uh, okay. So, yes, we may think that this first hypothetical example is science, but specifically, uh, we give, uh, since you, if you have followed these steps, we may call this an exploratory research, okay? I, I will go back to, the, to what, is, what it is an exploratory research in a few slides, just, just hang on. But let's go to the second hypothetical example. Uh, and again, imagine that you were, were walking in the field and you found the same situation. Uh, males and females of a ladybug species spread over uh, a given indiv different individuals of the same plant species. Some males mating and some males uh, alone do not mating. Okay, but instead of going to the field to measure this, you first just lay down you think about your life, about the sun, and when you is, uh, think, when you are thinking about this, may, you may imagine, for example, or you may remember that in this ladybug species, females are greater than males, and for this reason, they may be more stationary than males. Okay, and based on this, you may also think or imagine that males that are more efficient in searching for females may experience higher chances of copulation, okay? Uh, if you think about that and you want to, to evaluate if this uh, last situation relating males efficient, efficiency in searching and chance of copulation, you could uh, go to the field, again, make observations, select, 40 uh, individuals of the same plant species, collect all males, register whether each male was mating or not, 
but you probably won't do all the four measurements that was that, that were done on the first example. You probably would change these four measures just for this one, which is flight capacity, because your hypothesis is stated that males that were more efficient in searching for females. So this could be, in this situation, a more suitable measure than the other three to evaluate the possibility that you thought, okay? Again, we may ask if this is science. Again, is this an intellectual and practical activity? I think that similar to the first example, yes. In addition, you thought about a given process before collecting your data. Uh, was this a systematic study? Again, yes, because you had a systematic way to collect your data. Yes. And was it based on observation and experiment? And yes, we can say this because you collected the data and made some observations. Perhaps you should uh, also be interested in making some um, experiments, such for example, manipulating maybe wings to see if they change the flight capacity and to see if they change their mating status after doing the first uh, battery of uh, data recording, okay? But again, since we uh, checked all these conditions, we can uh, state that, yes, the second situation is also size, but we give a different name for this. We call this a confirmatory research because before going to the field, we have thought about uh, a, a specific possibility to be investigated. Okay, I, I confess that, that I don't, do not like very much the, the word confirmatory because we will discuss this more tomorrow, but uh, it is very difficult to confirm a hypothesis. Actually, we don't test directly hypothesis, but it is the word that is most commonly used. And it is an approach that can be considered science, okay? So we have, up to this point, uh, the possibility to perform an exploratory research or a confirmatory research. And the main difference here is that in exploratory research, uh, we are mainly interested or is mostly directed to explore patterns in data while in confirmatory research, uh, it is most direct to test scientific hypotheses that are, and this is important, that are stated before the study is conducted, okay? Uh, in, in real life, in actual life, uh, they are interchangeable. So there are researchers that often perform and develop exploratory researches, then confirmatory researches. There are researchers that are more direct only to confirmatory researches and so on. And they have difference in, in their main purpose or their efficiencies, okay? Exploratory research are more efficient in, the, in identifying patterns um, with some exceptions, I will discuss this later, but they are not so efficient in testing mechanisms, in testing processes that may explain the patterns, okay? While in confirmatory research, they are not so efficient in detecting or identifying patterns because they often use a smaller group of data. They, they, do not, they are not direct to collect many different types, many different variables, but they are more efficient in general to test mechanisms, okay? Um, and the most important point here is that by doing a confirmatory research, we uh, should use, we have to use a hypothesis. Uh, I think that we may take a little break just for questions if you have any question. Uh, can I stop this? Oh, I'm kinda lost. Okay, um, there is some question up to this point. Actually, I said to you that you could raise your hand, but I don't know how to do this. I think that, yes, uh, you could use the reaction option. I have you have this option here. And if you have any question, just raise your hand and this will uh, just show up for me here, okay?
Okay, if you don't have any question, I will keep going. Uh, and sorry, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. you have a question. Cristina, uh, you may choose if you want to write the question in the chat or may or open our microphone and make the question, okay? Um, I think I can um, ask by, um, by me, not writing. Uh, well, actually, I have a question. How does exploratory research can um, I don't like complain, like, uh, like complain a uh, confirmatory research. Uh, Christina, the, the, your microphone was very low. I, I couldn't hear very, very well. Could you write your question for me in the chat? Send private to me so, so it won't, it would be easier to, to see. Display the last slide. Uh, okay, uh, Patrick, uh, I will display the last slide. As soon as I uh, answer this question, I'll go back to my presentation, display the last slide, okay? Great, thank you. Um, Cristina, are you writing your question? Uh, Vanessa also have a question. You can open your microphone or send it while I think Christine is writing her question. Okay, I'll wait. Is it possible to start a confirmatory study and realize you should change to exploratory one? Uh, Vanessa, I... Okay, uh, my tendency is to, to... When I start a confirmatory study, uh, I often have to, to investigate some prior uh, information. I will show this to you. I often call this a fact, which is often based on exploratory research. So when you are planning your study and you intend to do a confirmatory study, you often have to, to, to have some prior information before doing this. So uh, the short answer is yes, but I think, uh, and I hope by showing some um, suggestions here, you will know at the beginning if it will be necessary to perform an exploratory study before doing a confirmatory one, okay? But yes, it can be unpredictable things uh, always occur and you may just um, realize that you need to do an exploratory study before doing a confirmatory one, even if your original intention was to begin by using a confirmatory study, okay? Uh, in, in my opinion, a taxonomist is a scientist. Yes, 
for me, they, they are scientists. Uh, they also have to investigate many different processes. For example, if they are uh, investigating phylogenetic relationships between species, they are working with to, to understand many different evolutionary processes. They are scientists. There's no doubt about it. Uh, okay. Any more questions? Cristina, did you did you give up? Give up? Okay, I'll continue the presentation. Uh, I'll have another uh, interval for questions. And if you want to, to make a question about this first part on the second interval, you can well you can also do it. Okay. So let's get back. Uh, oh, sorry, not this one. Oh, there was another. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, if this workshop will be available, yes, we are recording this workshop, and the Animal Behavior Society will turn, will make it available on the website. Okay. Um, just here. Okay. Um, let me just see if I can. Oh, yes, much, much better now. Um, so, as I said to you, if we want to work with a confirmatory research, we need to use hypotheses, okay? And first of all, we need to know what is a hypothesis. So um, I, I searched for many different definitions. They are all very similar, so I decided to show just one. But in short, a hypothesis is basically a statement providing a causal explanations for the phenomena we observe, okay? So it is important to highlight that a hypothesis is based on this middle part, which is the causal explanations. Um, okay, this one. So uh, if I could provide some simple examples of hypothesis, they should be stated in uh, structures such as this one. A is affected by B, for example, imagine that A is some variable that you have some interest, that you think that is important, that you want to investigate, actually. And B, you think that the variable that could cause variations in A. So you should state a hypothesis A is affected by B. The second possibility uh, that I often see, A increases or decreases, depends on the hypothesis, in response to B. Again, we have two variables, which is A and B. And uh, this hypothesis relates then in, in, in a specific direction, which is increasing or decreasing, okay? And we have some variations such as A is higher or smaller in B than C. So we have three, three variables here. Uh, and a hypothesis may involve more than two variables, okay? They, Specifically in behavior ecology, they often involve one variable that we call the response variable, the variable that is affected by other, which is A in these examples, and another one, which uh, I'm calling B, uh, or and it could be B, C, and D, and uh, other variables that we often call predictor variables or explanatory variables, okay? Uh, in the examples, in the, the second hypothetical example that I have shown to you, I used this hypothesis, okay? I stated that males that are more efficient in searching for females may experience higher chances of copulation. And the A and B parts are uh, present in this hypothesis. The A part is here. The chance of copulation is the response variable, is the thing that I think that is affected by this part, which is the B, B part, uh, the efficiency of the B efficiency in searching for females, okay? So remember that when we work with hypotheses, we often make relationships between two or more variable, 
and we provide it in a causal relationship, okay? Often one variable being affected by one or more variables. Um, and the, the, the most frequently question when I teach this to, to students in the beginning of their career is why we should, why should we use hypothesis? And I think that there is at least three main uh, advantages in using hypothesis. The first one is that hypotheses are more suitable to test for causal relationships, okay? This occurs because to state, to, to formulate a hypothesis, you have to think about how different variables may be related, how each variable may relate to each other. So by providing a hypothesis before going, before developing your study, uh, you have a, a better direction on how to test for causal relationships. And very associated to this, uh, by formulating a hypothesis, you may be able to improve your ability to think and execute experiments. Uh, imagine in the second situation, uh, when I provide the hypothesis relating male efficiency to search for females and uh, mating occurrence. Uh, you probably would do something as an observation experiment. You would go to the field, collect males, but you also may uh, want to do an experiment. And if you have a, a prior expectation on how mating uh, a male trait should be related, it is easier to think about how you could manipulate male traits to evaluate if, in fact, male flight capacity in this case could affect mating chances. And one very important point that I thought that, that, that I have said that I will turn here is that by doing confirmatory research, you often reduce the chances to be, and this is very difficult to say in English, inadvertently guided by the data. Uh, wh why is this important? Because um, when we do uh, uh, some study, we often have the theoretical part, okay, in which we are thinking about processes, but we also have to analyze our data, okay? And for example, in the first example that I have shown to you, uh, I'll probably do some statistical analysis to evaluate whether male mating status was related to each one of these four traits, okay? So I could do statistical analysis for this one. Uh, imagine, for example, I'll show some, a specific situation that is not very common, okay? But, but, but imagine that I do one, uh, statistical analysis based on frequentist test relating body mass with male mating status. Then I do another test relating fat content with male mating status. A third one relating immune response to male mating status. And a fourth one relating flight capacity to male mating status. If I do this in each test, I will incur a 5% chance of finding uh, a relationship between male mating status and one of these traits, even though this relationship does not exist, um, which you call type one error, okay? If I do four different tests, this 5% will increase to 20% of chances to find, to, to, to find this type one error, and we don't know that it is type one error. So we may wrongly conclude that this variable is related to this or this or this or this, even though in nature uh, they are not related, okay? Another point here is that, for example, imagine, imagine that I'm God and I know which male trait affect male mating uh, success, okay? And this trait is male color. So in fact, it is not male fight, uh, flight capacity, not body mass, not immune response that affect the chance that a male will mate. It's male color. Females may perform um, mate choice, for example, and they may prefer males with some specific color better, okay? But 
due to male development, due to many trade-offs that individuals face, male color may be related to body mass, fat content, male response, fat capacity, okay? If this occurs, if male color is related to these traits, even though it is the trait that uh, is the, the actual cause of mating, and you just correlate mating with this three, you would probably find some correlation here and conclude that mating is determined by male body mass, they fight fat content, human response or flight capacity, even though they are not the actual causes of male mating success. So if you do an exploratory research, you have to be, to, to keep in mind that you may incur higher possibilities of committing some type of ill. They also can be committed in a confirmatory research, okay? But the chances are smaller when we compare to the to exploratory research, mainly because we probably do additional experiments when we do confirmatory research. And uh, if this second situation occur, it is called a spurious correlation, okay? Uh, when two variables are correlated, even though they are not uh, related in fact, because there is a third one that calls both uh, to be correlated. And, and this is very common, okay? I, I'm not sure if you know this, this website, which is based on spurious correlations. I just took one example to show to you. Uh, and I find it very interesting because they collect real data to show how things that do not have any causal relationship may show very strong correlations. So in this example, they quantified the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool, okay, which is in red here. They also uh, quantified the number of films in which Nicolas Cage appeared, which is in black and on this side, between 1999 and 2009, okay? and define this pattern, okay? So you can see that Nicolas Cage is highly correlated to the number of people that drowned by falling into a pool. And, and I want to believe that Nicolas Cage are not drowning people just pushing them to a pool, okay? So th there is no real cause between these two variables, but we may find correlation between them. And this is the same problem when we correlate many different variables in our studies. And these have higher chances if we do exploratory research and although it's still, uh, uh, still possible, smaller chances when you do confirmatory research, okay? Um, there is another group of reason that I can show you as, as uh, motivations for you to, to develop confirmatory research. Uh, although I do not like them very much because I, I, I prefer to use the philosophical explanations. I think that they are more appealing, they are more sexy, but we may think about practical reasons, okay? Uh, and is related to the journals where you want to publish your study. Um, my impression is that this changes a lot through time and a lot among journals, but many, many, many journals, they explicitly prefer confirmatory research. So for example, I went to the uh, animal behavior webpage and clicked on the AMM scopes of the journal. And one of the first things that, sh that is shown uh, on the website is this part here, in which they states that animal behavior publishes original papers relating to all aspects of the behavior and of animals, including humans, okay? Papers may be filled, laboratory and theoretical studies, okay, again, but this part is important. Preference is given to studies that are likely to be of interest to the broad readership of the journal and that test explicit hypotheses rather than being purely descriptive. Uh, this means that the journal gives preference to confirmatory research, okay? Uh, I also went to the website of Behavior Ecology, and they do not explicitly show the word hypothesis, but, and then Zim Scope again, 
they say that the behavior ecology construes the field in its broadest sense to include the use of ecological and evolutionary processes to expand the occurrence of adaptive significance of behavior patterns and the use of behavior processes to both predict ecological patterns and inform conservation and wildlife management strategies. You can see here that they are uh, interested in processes and processes are often uh, explicitly treated when you do a confirmatory research. And the last uh, example is in the College Letter, which is a more general journal, okay? They do not publish only behavioral uh, ecology studies, but again, in the MM scope part, they state that manuscripts relating to the ecology of all taxa in, in any biome and geographic area will be considered and priority will be given to those papers exploring or testing clearly stated hypotheses. So uh, many different journals uh, explicitly state that they will give priority or they prefer confirmatory research. So by both the, the philosophical side or the practical side, uh, I think that confirmatory research has many uh, advantages. So again, I'd like to stop here and see if you have any question up to this point. Oh, that there is some. Uh, let's see, there are some questions here. Observational research, entered the classification and exploratory research. Uh, Lida or Leda, sorry if, if I, I'm pronouncing wrong your name. Yeah, I, here in Brazil, I see many discussions about uh, people that, that think that observational research is necessary in exploratory research, descriptive one. And I, in particular, disagree because we may be able to think about uh, hypotheses, to make predictions, and go to the field to test if some uh, natural patterns occur, uh, if, this, if the given spot, the hypothesis is true. So for me, Observational research is not necessarily an exploratory research. Uh, what determines the difference is uh, whether you had a prior hypothesis or no. Um, the second point is that if you do an observational study, you, have, you do not manipulate anything in the field or in a laboratory, you have less sure, you, you cannot uh, state uh, with um, I, I, how can I say that? It is more difficult to state, to, to identify causal relationships, okay? Observational studies, they are, they, they are not prone to, to identify true causal relationships, but they may be confirmatory research. In, in my lab, we do a lot of this type of study because we often study species for which there is no prior information, so we have to go to the field but we often go to specific hypotheses to test, okay? Uh, let me see. Okay. Okay, a uh, question for Bianca Salazar. Could we get an example of what a hypothesis for an exploratory study would look like versus confirmatory, please? Uh, that's the point. In, in an exploratory study, you won't provide, you won't build a hypothesis before going to the field. You may think about uh, different hypotheses, but after seeing your results, okay, and I'll discuss this tomorrow, but this means that you should present this hypothesis in the discussion of your paper, not in the int introduction, okay? But the difference is in an exploratory study, you do not have a prior hypothesis. Why in a confirmatory one, you have this hypothesis before going to the field, okay? Before, sorry, I only think about you. Before doing your experiment, before collecting your data. Let's see, uh, Dariana. So when we are trying to find correlations, should we do confirmatory research, then exploratory research, or should we first use exploratory to see if there are pairs of correlations to then confirm those correlations with confirmatory research? Yes, uh, interesting question. Uh, again, 
you, you do not need to start your study by doing an exploratory one, okay? Uh, when I, I will explain the, uh, how we can use the fact part when we build uh, our study. And you will see that we do not need to start by doing exploratory research, okay? You may start by doing a confirm, you may start your work by doing a confirmatory research. There is no necessity. In some specific cases, you may need this, but, but, but this is not mandatory, okay? Um, again, if you want to find correlations, it depends on the way you thought your project. Um, if you have some prior expectation, okay, this means that you have some hypotheses, even though they are not explicitly stated, uh, and you go to the field and you, and this is an observational study, okay? You just collect the data in the field without making any experimental manipulation. Uh, you have a correlation in your hand, okay? And a correlation has the same problem independent if I have or had not a prior hypothesis. The difference here is that if you have a confirmatory study, you probably have uh, fewer correlations, fewer variables to correlate when you compare to an exploratory research. Um, uh, Eduardo Silva Jr., Edival, Edivaldo, sorry. Silva Jr., uh, could a phylogenetic tree be hypothesis? Uh, as I understand it, uh, okay, uh, uh, an important difference. I'm a behavior ecologist. I'm not a taxonomist or a systematic. Um, and, uh, my impression is that a phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis, okay? You, 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 by based on similarities that could be molecular or morphological or both, on different groups of uh, individuals or morphotypes, you establish what could be the uh, evolutionary pathway, the, the, the common ancestors, and this is a hypothesis, okay? Juan. Hello, my question. Define a prior conceptual framework. Will you always avoid spurious correlation? This is the solution. No. <laughs> In short answer, answer to your question uh, is no. Because whenever you have um, data from um, natural situations in which you do not make any manipulative experiment, uh, you have the risk to find uh, spurious correlations, okay? Um, confirmatory research reduce this chance, but do not eliminate it, okay? Um, and experimental approaches also are adopted to reduce this possibility, but we, we will never be sure that we are completely removing this possibility. Uh, the conceptual framework, uh, if I correctly understood, is related to having a hypothesis, but also a theoretical background that you use it to build your hypothesis, okay? And this is used to, to construct what I, I pretentious call it in this course, a strong hypothesis. But I'll go back to this issue tomorrow, okay? Um, now from Julia Greenberg, at some point, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on behavior studies that make use of long-term data sets accumulate over a matter of decades. How do you approach exploratory versus confirmatory questions in these situations? Uh, it, it is the same point. Um, there are some studies in which the authors use it, historical data sets. Uh, how can I say this in English? But uh, long time series of data and they investigate patterns, they do not have prior hypothesis and they explicitly say that in, in the study and this is an exploratory research. On the other hand, there are many, many, many examples in which the authors stated a hypothesis and use it, uh, a data set, a uh, temporal data set to test hypothesis. This is the difference, the difference whether you uh, postulated, created a hypothesis before doing your analysis, before gathering your data or not. Uh, Lady, thank you, you're welcome. Lauren Johnson, can you conduct a confirm confirmational study even if you didn't collect data yourself? For example, the data was already collected years ago. 
uh, and you go in with a question, you can address with the data set based on the data collected. Uh, yes, Lauren, your question is very similar to the question about temporal time series, okay? Uh, you may use uh, databases, so you have prior question, prior hypothesis, you go, you collect data from this database that is already available, and you test specific predictions using this data set. It, it is totally acceptable and it is a confirmational, uh, confirmatory study. Um, Gaurav, even though journals may explicitly state that they require clear state hypothesis, how exactly do journals know whether the study they accept are actually confirmatory studies? Oh, that, that, oh boy, this is a very important question. In other words, can research just use a prior data set to conduct an exploratory analysis, but present word the paper as if it were a confirmatory study? I guess we'll talk about this a little. Yeah, I, I will talk about this when I will discuss Harkin. I also will show you some studies that quantify uh, the number of papers that apparently do this. So yes, people do. This should be avoided. There, there is a lot of problems that I should that I discuss to you. I think that I will discuss they to you, them to you tomorrow, but I, I, I don't remember exactly, but this, this, this can occur. Okay, and the last question from Jane Miller. Yeah, I just was curious if, to, if can you hear me first? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, first, my question is, would you then uh, state that Jane Goodall was doing exploratory um, science or studies? Is that your concept? Uh, which person did you did hear? Um, Jane Goodall, her studies of the apes and chimpanzees. Okay, um, I, I, would you? I know her, but I did. Exploratory. Yeah, I, I never read her papers, so I will be okay. unable to answer you okay. if she could do the exploratory. Say, my study. My study on the observation of red kangaroos started as exploratory, then morphed into a confirmatory because we saw a behavior that we saw in the zoo that we did not see in the wild. So we then looked at, uh, we had a hypothesis based on why, what was going on, that, and we just made the, um, the we, our thought process was because there were no trees shading that area, so they were digging to get to cooler earth. And it turned out that is what was going on. And they didn't need to oh. do that in the wild because they had trees and they had shade. So they didn't exhibit any digging. Yeah, and, and I think that many studies uh, show the, this, this change. They start as exploratory ones because we do not know many things about the, the species. We have to do something that is more exploratory. And then we go to, to a confirmatory study to, to test whether the, the parents that we found were actually caused by the things that we think that should be causing them. Though the, the and, and no zoos at all do this. And zoos do those kind of studies all the time to then more effectively make sure that the habitats are similar to their habitats in the wild so that they don't exhibit behaviors that are abnormal to the wild. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Okay, let, let's see, uh, I forgot the time, sorry. Um, I'll show you here again, here. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, if I was able to, to show you some advantage of using confirmatory research, uh, probably some of you will be thinking at this point that many studies in, in published, many published articles should be based on confirmatory research, okay? Uh, when I was doing my undergrad course in biological science, I, I had this impression. I, I had an advisor that was um, that used uh, confirmatory research most of the time, and I thought that this was the uh, prevalent approach in published articles. 
But I found, to, to provide this lecture, I found these two articles that I think that are very provoking uh, in their recent articles. This one uh, published this year, 2021. This one published in 2019. So both are very recent. And in both the studies, they um, try to quantify the frequency, the, the percentage uh, of studies that explicitly or somewhat explicitly use it, uh, a confirmatory approach or at least use it hypothesis in the introduction, okay? And for my surprise, they found these percentages. I, I think that this is for the, the first one, the, the 19, uh, 2019. They found that uh, in the worst scenario, just 6.7% of studies in ecology uh, adopt or use hypothesis in the better scenario, 26. And this one, they found that this, the both worst and better scenario varied between 19 and 26%. And again, I think that this is somewhat worrying because they're showing that most studies, around 74% of studies, do not explicitly use or, or try to use hypothesis uh, to, to be developed, okay? So they, they did not use the distinction between exploratory and confirmatory uh, research in these two articles here, but this means that uh, until now, most studies are exploratory, okay? Um, and, uh, it, these have an important consequence, mainly for students that are at the beginning of their career. Because when I started my, my, my undergrad course, and I think that when you start doing your research, you often uh, read, but even though people use different uh, names, that confirmatory research is important for better understanding of mechanisms. And yes, this is true you often hear that confirmatory research should be based on hypothesis. Yes, they should. Nice. I, I, I remember when my advisor said that to me and I think, oh my God, this is great. But then you discover that just a few published articles use hypothesis at least properly, okay? Uh, just an observation here. Uh, I'm using at least properly because I'm using the two prior articles to, to say this, okay? I, I do not mean to be offensive. Please. Um, but this make this face in me because, oh my God, I, I admit that this is important, but just a few articles use it. Yeah. But at the same time, I often hear and I often heard that despite this, I should build hypothesis before collecting my data. So I know that this is important, but I do not have many published examples. So my face offends this one. Okay, because how could I build uh, a project, how I could think about how to begin a study if I do not have many examples in, published, in the published literature, okay? And I hope this is the point in which I say to you, don't worry, because there is a lot of articles discussing this and showing strategies for you to begin uh, your study, even though we do not have many examples, okay? And for this, I would like to show you the Fantastic Four, which is not this Fantastic Four, and I think that most of you even do not know this one, but it's this Fantastic Four, which is the fact, the question, the hypothesis, and the prediction. Basically, uh, this is an initial structure that I recommend you to use when you want to develop a confirmatory study, okay? So I show each of one of these to you um, and we'll start with the fact, okay? So when I, uh, at this time I avoided searching for uh, a definition, but I provided one by me, okay? And if I would define fact in this context, I would define fact as a biological pattern with as few as possible explanatory interpretation, okay? Uh, whenever I say this definition to, to my stu students, they often do this face to me because it is not so simple to understand. 
So for this, I'll show you a video and we will try a practical approach to identify facts, okay? So uh, I'll show a, a very small video. I think that it has less than one minute. I don't remember exactly. And uh, when I play this video, I want you all to try to identify different facts that you may be seeing on the, on the video, okay? And you are trying to identify a fact uh, remember this definition that you should remove most of the explanatory interpretation that you can remove to describe a fact. Okay, so let's just change here. Uh, just a question. Let me see if I... is, that there, is there a video being shown to you? You, you can answer in the chat. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. Uh, and I just closed the video, just wait. Stop sharing, let me just open the video again. Okay, uh, try to share it again. Why I'm trying to, to show my slides again, just think about facts that you, you could be able to describe when uh, based on this video, okay? Here, so uh, we went back to the slide and there was a video, okay? So when I show this video in, in my classes, most of the responses that, are, that I receive involve three possibilities. And, and when I ask people just to describe facts, okay? Uh, most answers is just that there is a courtship behavior at some point in the video. Another group of students often, often state that um, there was a foraging behavior. And the third one that is uh, very common is that males are doing male harassment on females, okay? Uh, imagine that this is the first time that you see this behavior, there is no published articles of this behavior, and you will start your project on it. If you state that it's a courtship behavior, actually, you probably did that, if there were some people in this presentation that did, did this, you probably did that because you saw individuals of different sizes, and you assumed that the, the greater one is the female, and why the smaller one is the male. Oh boy. Uh, for the people, uh, again, you see what is assumed to be a male interacting with the female. And for this reason, you often state that this is a courtship behavior, okay? Uh, for people that uh, state that there, there is a forage behavior at the end of the video mainly, it's because they saw the major one uh, going up the or absorbing that liquid in for male harassment. Uh, most people say that because they saw different individuals of the smaller size touching the individual of the greatest size, and they presume they assume that the smaller one are males and the greater one is the female. Okay, so if you do that, if you say that there is a courtship behavior, forage behavior, male harassment in the first place. If mainly if there is no published literature on this behavior, you may be uh, making a lot of interpretations. Okay, so uh, I do not recommend you to use it. Okay, there is no, this, this is not a description with as few as possible explanatory interpretation. 
I would change, for example, uh, what is often called the hardship behavior situation. If I would describe it as a fact, I would remove the explanatory interpretation. I would write it in this way. I would write that there is two individuals of a spring tail species uh, by, by saying that spring tail species, I'm actually doing some interpretation, but okay. Two individuals of spring tail species with different sizes recurrently touched their heads and performed a push and retreat movement. These uh, still have some interpretation because it, it is almost impossible to remove all the interpretation, but uh, it is it has less interpretation than the prior examples. Okay, so this would be a, a, a better way to describe the fact. This is a way to describe it, removing the interpretation. So. Um, you see that this is very, very important because this will affect the question that we make to, to start our study, okay? The question is the next step, and by doing, uh, by, by providing more interpretation the fact, we may bias the type of questions that we make. I, I will return to this point later, but first I would discuss another possibility, because whenever I show this, uh, most people ask if this has to be uh, the, the fact has to be something that I observed, that I that I saw in the field or in the lab or in the zoo. Okay, and the short answer is no. Okay, you can use facts described in other articles. For example, for this this video, there is some studies that already describe this behavior. For example, this study in Journal of Pathology in two thousand. Uh, six, uh, they describe it exactly the things that you just saw in this video, okay? And they, they, they repeated this procedure. They were able to suggest that this is related to the to courtship uh, behavior. But, but let, let's get, uh, I decided to show an, a different uh, example, okay? This is an applied example. So uh, let's see this article here. It was published last year, 2020. Um, and in this article, these three authors uh, investigated a behavior that is called uh, mate choice copying in the guppy Resilia reticulata. Okay, they, they actually they, they did um, a little more than that. This is the Resilia reticulata. This is the male, oh, my pointer. This is the male, that there is actually, there is a huge variation uh, among local populations, but this is the male. Uh, it is often very ornamented, and this is the female, okay? And in this study, these authors were interested in investigating whether relative difference in sexual traits between males, uh, that mean that they have males that uh, have many difference in their ornament, ornamentation, if such difference between males could affect uh, male mate choice decisions. Specifically, they want to test whether this difference in male traits could affect the decision of a male to perform uh, a mate, a copying behavior, mate choice copying behavior, okay? But um, I, I think you should to, to note here that if they want to test whether trait difference between males affect if a male will perform a, a copying behavior or not, and if the male will choose the female with which he will try to copulate. Uh, actually, this will only make sense if we know before doing this uh, study that males perform mate choice and that males perform copying behavior. Uh, for, for the ones who do not know which is copying behavior, it occurs when an individual see another individual of the same species, which we can call the model individual. They see the model individual doing some, some behavior and they do the same behavior. In case of mate choice, uh, it is more common among females, but uh, in this case here, the males see another male choosing a female and if this male perform the copying behavior, he will choose the same female that was chosen before by the other individual. This is the copying behavior. So this uh, objective 
uh, will only be can only be imagined if they knew prior to this study that males perform mate choice because if they do not, there is no point in making this question, and also that they know that males perform copying behavior. And both information were already published before this article, for example. In 2004, these uh, researchers uh, identified that males perform mate choice, okay? Male groupies perform mate choice. And in 2015, uh, the, the same group of authors uh, described that males perform copying behavior, okay? So they use the information on the results presented here and the information on the results presented here as facts to build their study. So they, they didn't go to the field to see a pattern. They used published information as facts and started their new study based on this uh, published information. So you may use both approaches. You may use things that you personally saw in the field, you personally saw in, in the lab, or you may use information that was already published. So uh, I, I think there is here, there is a, a, an important difference, for example, I live in Brazil, and this is, a, this is a country with many, many, many species, it's highly diverse, and there is a very short history uh, of science here. So for most species that I and my students start to, to, to research, start a, a study, we often do not have any information about what they do, why they do some behavior, so we have to use the first example that I showed you on the spring tail. I had to see the behavior and make the most basic questions because they are important for me to build the facts for more complex ones. But in other regions, in other countries, they, are, uh, they have less species, they have a longer history of science, and most situations for a given species, they have published information that they can use as facts to build their studies. But both approaches are acceptable, okay? And I think yeah, that I should give another stop here. So is there any question up to this point? Let's see the, the chat. Oh yeah, yes, the video didn't have any sound. All clear, all clear. Okay, so I'll keep going. And if you just, oh yeah, the presentation will be available on the um, website of the, the, the ABS. Okay, with the presentation, sorry, I missed one question. Can you go back to the hypothesis made from the facts for a second? Yeah, uh, I'll just go back to the hypothesis, Ricky. Here. Oh, I, I think that the second example, I did not show a hypothesis. I just presented their objective. Is this one, right? Oh, on the guppy? Hiki, are you there? Okay. <laughs> I thought that you had some question. Um, okay. Uh, what is the difference? Okay, from Edvaldo Silva, what is the difference between an observation and a fact? Mm, I think that uh, there is no difference in most situations because what we treat as an observation, specifically if it is a recurrent observation, okay, uh, can be treated as a fact to start uh, a study. Okay, you may make a question about an observation that, that you made. So there is no actually major difference between these two, uh, which observation and fact, okay? Okay, so I'll keep going. And if you have any more questions, just write it down and then I'll read all those questions. Uh, 
Let me show this here again. Yes. So the next step when, when I think about the Fantastic Four is the question, okay? Uh, the question, uh, it is an intermediate point is a connection between your fact and your hypothesis, okay? Hypothesis should, should be made after you have your question. And it is a very important step, okay? If I would define the question for this structure, I would say that a question should be a simple, objective, and answerable question about the fact. So it is directly related to the fact, and it is a thing that you want to know about the fact, okay? Um, so le let's get the, the fact that I provided two individuals of a spring tail species with different size recurrently touched their heads and performed a push and retreat movement, okay? Uh, by making the, this, this fact, by stating or showing this fact, I may think of different questions that can be done about the fact. For example, I may ask what kind of interaction was that or is that? I may ask why there was more than one of these small individuals interacting with the greater one, or for example, why individuals touched their heads and performed a push and retreat movement. Okay, I, actually, I can make many different questions about effect. But if we are we are thinking about a scientific question, these three uh, characteristics are very very important. Okay, they should be simple they should be objective, and they should be answerable. Uh, always, always remember that, and I'll try to show some examples of questions that are not simple or not objective or unanswerable. And again, this is very difficult to say in English. Um, and another important point is whenever I say to students that your question should be simple, should be objective, should be answerable. They often make this space for me. They say, no, but what, why is this important? Okay, why well, is important to avoid certain interpretations in the fact, and why it is important to formulate simple questions. Uh, the, the, this question is often followed by one uh, statement that I see many articles that do not do this. I don't know why, but I always remember that I see many dead people <laughs> when, when people say this to me. So I, I will show you some examples of situations in which you insert a interpretation of the fact or do not formulate, formulate simple questions to try to show you what are the potential problems with this, okay? So the first example is a problem with fact descriptions. Uh, let's get back to our video. This is this this spring tail, and imagine that again you do not have any prior information about this species, and you describe the fact as this one: a male and a female performing a courtship behavior. Okay, which is the most common description that I see when people uh, see this video. If this is the fact, and the next step of your project or of your study should be to make a question, you probably won't do this question. You probably won't ask whether uh, or what kind of interaction uh, this is, because you are already stating that this is a courtship behavior, okay? So this question is not suitable for this type of fact. You probably won't also do this question. Why do they do this? Because if it is a courtship behavior, they are doing this to mate, okay? You will probably do a different kind of question, such as this one. Are there male traits that increase mating chance? Okay, this, this is a, an actual question that can be made if this is the fact. Or you can ask whether females are performing mate choice. Also, this is a, a suitable question for this type of fact, okay? But again, let's play God. Let's imagine that I'm God and I know what they are doing. And in fact, they should imagine that are not doing they are not doing courtship behavior. They are doing a trophobiosis. Where are you here? 
they are doing a trophobiosis. Imagine that some individual just acquires some food and is passing some, and is passing some food to uh, the other individual. So if this is a trophobiosis and you describe your fact as this one, I, I don't know if you can see the problem here because there's no point in describing this because none of these questions will make sense because this fact does not occur. It, it, it is untrue, okay? So there's no point in, in using interpretations, mainly when you, when you do not have uh, additional information. And if this fact is wrong, obviously these questions could not be made. So if you do, uh, if you insert a lot of interpretation at the beginning of your study, you may incur the risk to make questions that does not make sense. That, that's the problem. That's why we need to remove interpretations when we describe our effect. And remember, if you are using prior articles, the fact section of the article is the results, not the discussion, okay? In the results, they provide the facts. The discussion, they interpret the facts. They make some interpretation. I, I don't remember the word. Uh, let's get now to problems with questions, okay? I will show you three different problems that, that I often see uh, students or that I often receive when I, when I try to do this type of exercise with the students, okay? Uh, now I use the first fact that I present to you, two individuals uh, performing the, the touching their heads and performing the push and retreat movement. Okay, and for example, one question that can be done in situation is this one. Are they performing mate choice while choosing a suitable position site and avoiding predators? Okay, uh, when we do this type of question, uh, uh, I don't know if you can perceive it, but they are treating about different processes. Uh, the first one is mate choice, the first one is uh, of position site choice, and the last one uh, predator uh, anti predator behaviors. Okay, they, they are even they, they are not related, so it's very difficult to provide an answer to this question, which means that it it will be very difficult to postulate hypothesis. Okay, so this type of question is very complex. Avoid this one. They they, they do not help you in. Um, imagining providing a hypothesis, okay? Second example that you should avoid. Same fact, but the question is, are they performing a chemical communication about individual genetic quality while the male tries to force a copulation? Uh, in, in this case, they are actually a little related, okay? Chemical communication about individual genetic quality, which can be related to mate choice, or uh, male trying to force a copulation. But again, if I think about this question, I cannot think about a direct and simple answer. Actually, my brain becomes like this. But for me, th this question is pointless, okay? And in many instances, uh, people, when they do questions such as this, they uh, insert processes in the question, things that should be stated in the hypothesis, they just bring them to the question. And, and this is not a good way to do a question, okay? And the last one, uh, here's the question. You may ask, are female performing post copulatory selection? Okay, this is simple. This is objective. I can think about uh, uh, an answer to this, but if you do this question and I only know this fact, my face would be this one, okay? Because at this stage, this question is unanswerable. This is not the most simple, the, the first question that can be made about this fact, okay? So if you do this kind of questions, you have difficulties in, in stating sound hypotheses to use in your study. And specifically, avoid inserting your question things that process that you think uh, are occurring. Leave this, this mechanism, this process to your hypothesis, okay? Uh, the, the, I think that one important tip here is to think what would be a question that a child would do, okay? Because child often do very simple questions and they are very, very helpful, 
helpful when we need to think about hypotheses. So for example, you could change to, why do they perform this movement? Okay, this is a very simple question, a question based on why, but that is not mandatory. And now this would be my face. Okay, I would be much happier with this because now I can think about different response, different answers to this question. Okay, and I think that we have another interval here. So let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, uh, people, is there any, any question? So uh, the last one, hi. Um, you, you said that was uh, a question you liked, the why do they uh, make yeah. these movements? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's it just that I, I didn't hear, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I, I like this question because it is simple. It is objective, and I can I can think about direct answers to to this question. Um, and again, this is important because the question will provide some direction to the answers that you will think, and the answers will represent your hypothesis. And, and that's the, the very important point at this stage. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, How do you balance make okay? How do you balance making simple questions with logistical constraints of field research and wanting to collect as much information as possible while you are in the field? And this is a question from Heather or Heather. Sorry if I, I wrong pronounce your name. Uh, Heather, th this is very, very, very common. Many, 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 many people uh, make the, this question. Okay. Um, First of all, when you are thinking about the fact and the question and the hypothesis up to, to the third step, I would ask you all to avoid thinking about logistical constraints because it, it is very common that we start thinking about our study, our experience, our study about how we could develop an, ob an observation or an experiment, okay? We, we do, it is our, at least for me here in Brazil, our natural tendency to think from back to the beginning. So we think about the experiment and then we think about the prediction, then hypothesis and then uh, uh, question in fact. If you do that, you will always be some kind of tied to your uh, logistical constraints, okay? And this will incur the risk to avoid making very good questions and making very interesting hypotheses because you just gave up from an interesting hypothesis because you imagine that there is a problem in your, there is a difficulty in your observation and your experiment. So I, I highly recommend you to think before about the question and about the hypothesis. And after this, you may spend a lot of time, because this is often necessary, to think about how can I deal, how can I collect data to evaluate this specific hypothesis? Because this will open, this will often open new possibilities for you. Okay. Um, the same problem, uh, the same problem. You, Sometimes we go to the field, it is difficult to reach the, the, the place where we want to develop our study and we don't want to waste money, to waste time, okay? So we often collect many different uh, data. This is a tough one because I understand you, in Brazil, we do not have much financing for research. So when we have, we want to, to maximize our efficiency in the field. So. If you are able to, to collect the data, but again, you have a hypothesis, you collected more data than you need, a, a major diversity of data, but then you just use the data that you need to evaluate your hypothesis, there's no problem, okay? You, you just will um, 
keep the other data, and then you may think about different hypotheses and use those data. It is very similar to people that use published data sets, for example. So there's no problem at all. But the, the, the wrong point here is avoid correlating everything and presenting uh, hypotheses that you thought after seeing the results as if they were your original hypothesis. This is the problem, okay? Let's see. Okay, thank you. One thing that, okay, one from Johanna Goyce. One of the things that I perceive is that, as you say, very few articles have confirmatory research as opposed to exploratory research. Yes. However, there's so much we don't know that we need exploratory research. So what do we do with it? Toss it away until we can actually publish confirmatory research. I feel that this disregards the veil of natural history observational studies. Uh, Joanna, I, I, I partially agree with you. Um, so I, I use myself as example, okay? Uh, uh, for most species that we study here, we do, we start with information that we do not know, okay? Uh, they are pri previously unstudied species. Whenever we do this, uh, I spend some time, uh, for example, in the field, seeing what they do, uh, if there is some behavior that, that is recurrently adopted, things like that. After this, I, I use this to establish the facts that I intend to, to work on, okay? Uh, after establishing the fact, I make the question, the hypothesis, predictions, and then go to the field now to collect specific data, okay? Um, in many instances, this first study is purely observational because I, did not, I do not make any experiment, any manipulation. But when I collect the data, I collect a specific kind, a specific group of data that is important for me to test my hypothesis. So, so although it is an observational study, I use a confirmatory approach, okay? So, so you do not have to do exploratory research just because you are making natural observations, okay? And many of my first studies with a given species, they describe things, uh, behaviors mainly, but I gather these behaviors based on a specific processes, okay? So it is possible to do that. At the same time, I'm not saying I'm not saying that exploratory research, they are unnecessary. Actually, they are very necessary. People should publish them. This is, this is important, okay? And in some areas, for example, conservation biology, some areas, people often do much, much exploratory research Okay, and there's no problem in doing it. The problem is people need to know the difference. They need to know the flaws of each approach and treat them accordingly, okay? My, 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 my worry here is that in many instances, this study seems to be confirmatory, but it was originally exploratory. And, and that's the problem because people often uh, provide hypotheses that were not thought before they collect the data and the hypothesis in the introduction. That, that's the problem, okay? The, the problem of doing it wrongly. I hope I have answered you. Um, okay. Rafael Sanchez, is there a chance that asking a question like, why do they perform that behavior? It's too general or broad that the answer could have multiple facts playing a role, so the answer is hard to obtain. Um, Rafael, Yes and no. <laughs> um, the, the point in making a broad question like this one is to allow you to think about many different possible answers, okay? So this does not mean that you have to gather all of possible answers in the same answers. You, make, uh, you may make it separately, okay? A short answer exploring one possibility, a short one for the second possibility, a third one for the second possibility, and all of them are related to this question. Th that's the point. To provide a more diverse universe of possible answers, 
And then you may choose one or just a few ones to start your study. Okay, and imagine, for example, that you choose one answer, transform it into a hypothesis, investigate this, uh, investigate this hypothesis, and conclude that it is not uh, occurring, okay? It, it is not the real uh, response for this answer. So you may pick another answer for the same question, for the same fact, and then develop another study, okay? Th this is how we should do science, but by doing it in pieces, okay? The, the problem is when people have a broad question, but gather many different processes in the same hypothesis. In case you need, uh, you know that there is just one answer, but it's very complex uh, because you have to, to, you need other facts for this answer to, to, to be plausible, okay? Um, we, we can call these assumptions, but, but it's not relevant at this point. Um, in this case, perhaps you should investigate the other facts if, if they are true before providing this hypothesis, okay? Because uh, you are, is lacking an answerable, uh, uh, an answer that is that cannot be made at this point, okay? You need to, to investigate another facts to bind them together and then make a more complex question. Okay. Okay, take care. okay, from Carla, at this point in the example, would, be, would it be more accurate to do an exploratory research first to investigate who is performing this behavior and describe it properly? Uh, Carla, I'm not sure if I understood your question, but I think that you'd be interested in seeing if there is a male and a female there to see who is performing this behavior properly, right? Okay. Yes. Um, I, I'm, 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 I was avoiding this part with you, but um, to perform that kind of investigation, it is important to know if, if uh, they are individuals of the same sex or males and females, okay? Um, again, this could be an assumption, but um, it, it is the point where I, I consult, I asked for help for taxonomies of the, this group to explain to me there is a male and a female there, and then I go to the facts and questions. Okay. Um, let's see. People, um, here's the thing. The, the next part would be to show you hypotheses and predictions, okay? But we do not have much time today because we, we only have 15 minutes to, to uh, as our deadline. So I would like to, to avoid showing hypotheses and predictions today because most of us may be tired of the, this, this workshop. And tomorrow I start, I will start by showing hypotheses, predictions, and how we can differentiate between them. Okay, because I think it will be more suitable for us. Because on the other hand, I would have to cut it in the middle. Okay, so I prefer to stop now. Uh, if you don't have more questions, if you have more questions, you can make them. And tomorrow we start by the other two of the Fantastic Four, which is the hypothesis and prediction. Agree? Uh, we will meet at the same time, okay? So I don't know where you're from, but at the same time as today, uh, and the other half of this workshop, okay? I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you for all these compliments. At the same time, okay, you're welcome, you're welcome. Oh, I'm very glad that you like it. Uh, yes, this recording will be posted on the EBS website, okay? So, see you tomorrow.
Johanna, if you're still there, you can ask me a question. I just saw your chat here. I, um, I can ask you right now. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you so much for for the slides. I think they are great. I I um you know I've always tried to do hypothesis based research, but as I was saying, there's a lot of things that we didn't know. And you were talking about the um kind of using literature to to start your your questions, right? So mm -hmm. interestingly, I work with frogs. And there's the assumption that all these frogs, a particular group of frogs has egg attendance behavior. And so I'm testing that if, uh, if there's actual egg attendance behavior in a particular species, right? And, mm -hmm. and I'm doing it like that because the literature says that the whole group has it. However, it looks like my data is showing otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So when I submitted this for publication, the reviewers say, why do you call it egg attendance where, when clearly your data is show, showing otherwise? However, everything published before calls it egg attendance. So do you, do you understand the conundrum? Like, doesn't look like it's egg attendance, but everything before calls it egg attendance. And therefore, I, I'm using the term. So I'm, okay. I'm going back and forth with reviewers and they are like, well, is it or is not? And the answer is, I don't know, because it needs to be tested, right? Okay. So right now, I'm in an exploratory research phase, trying to figure out if there's any pattern. But, um, so my question is like, how can you, like I can't say that is egg attendance or is not egg attendance because it hasn't been tested. Right now I'm exploring. But I do feel that there's value in these explorations. So I don't know. Do you have any advice? Okay. Uh, let me just think if I correctly understood. Okay. Uh, you want to investigate, uh, you, you use the term egg attendance for frog species. That was always, that, that is always used for these species. But after collecting the data, you didn't have evidence that these species do egg attendance. And this is the problem because reviewers are saying that you shouldn't have used this term, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. L -l Let me think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, did you have a prior hypothesis in this study? Um, yeah, so because people have always called it egg attendance, I was looking into environmental variables. So I was looking to see that if maybe um, higher temperatures or higher humidity affected how long the, the parent remained with the clutch. So that was my hypothesis. So if this is some kind of egg attendance, you would expect that they modify their behavior based on the environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. And I found no significant differences. Yeah, you, you, you imagine that they would change the egg attendance according to temperature, but you didn't find any egg attendance. Uh, let me think how you could do this. I think that if you want to to be um, to show fidelity to to what you have thought in the first place, uh, perhaps you could use the, the first um, approach that that I think you use it. You just wrote that you expected egg attendance variation, but you did not find egg attendance. So there is the question about why did you not? perform egg attendance in this population. And I will put that in the, the discussion, okay? So I will provide the rational hypothesis and then state that there was no egg attendance at all. And, and I also see uh, why researchers are arguing that you should not do this. Because in fact, they, they are asking you, they, somehow they are saying that you should have gone to the field and investigate whether they do or not do egg attendance. So if this first approach do, does not, it's not being accepted, 
perhaps you should try a, a more explorative one and, uh, and just state that uh, in your manuscript that egg attendance may vary, uh, you do not have any information about this, and a more descriptive study about the lack of egg attendance in a species that do not perform it. And then a following up study would explore why they do not show egg attendance. I don't know if this is helpful for you. Yeah, well, the, the thing is that um, when you think about these, so I started with the assumption with the literature that calls it egg attendance, right? Like, so literature calls it egg attendance. Clearly, the data shows that there's no variation, that there's absolutely no significant differences in the amount of time the parents stay with the clutch, depending on environmental variables, right? So then re the reviewer said, like, oh, then it's not egg attendance. And I'm like, well, I cannot oh, okay, okay. not start. I cannot no, no, the, start. The, 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 yeah, the, this is a different problem. Because the, 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 the adults, I, I don't know if, if there is a paternal, maternal, or, or both, both sex, but you see that the adults stay with the eggs, that there is, there is uh, what you are calling egg attendance, right? Or no? Yeah, so the adults stay with the eggs, yes. So the, for me, it is not the problem with the processes or the fact. It is, it is a kind of semantic problem, right? Because mm -hmm. you are using a term that was already used, but reviewers do not want to accept this term, right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. Because this is semantic, and you have the, the other articles that already use it, this description for the same behavior. But in case uh, they do not accept it at all, and you want to, to have accepted, you may just describe what the fathers do, the, the, the fathers do, the parents do, sorry. The parents do that they stay with the eggs for a given time. And perhaps you may explain that in some uh, studies, this is considered egg attendance. You, you just refer, you, you blame the other studies, but you just refer to the other study and say that the same behavior is considered as egg attendance in other study, and you will just say that fathers stay, uh, parents stay with the eggs. I do not see a, a great problem at all. I do not understand yeah. why reviewers are, are arguing about this. I know. Uh, yeah, me neither. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think it, I think that's a, I hadn't considered that the plane like these this behavior in some species is considered this. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But yeah, yeah, yeah so the thing is that that I was I was a little hesitant about is because everybody else before has called it that, right? So I was mm -hmm. just trying to be consistent with the past literature, but the way you put it actually works. And I'm gonna try that. Yeah. And there Thank is you. uh, well, you're welcome. Frankie Castell is, is answering here too, because uh, he's saying that it reminds him of studying non-grooming functions of a grooming behavior. Well, we call it mm -hmm. grooming behavior, but should the but show the animal the show the animal may not actually be cleaning the surface, could be spreading formative scent sense. Okay, yes, because we, we have some. This is the problem when we interpret uh, behavior and put interpretation in the name, but then th there is a distinction between what, what is the interpretation and what is the behavior per se, okay? Uh, okay, people, if you have any more questions, we may now <laughs> finish the, this meeting and see you tomorrow, okay? Thank you very much for coming. De nada.